Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever or whenever you are. Welcome to the Lightning Podcast. I am your host, Cyrus Polisbon, and I am joined today by a new guest, Alexander Kim, or as we call him, Sasha. What's up, man? Hey, Cyrus. It's great to be joining you, finally. Yes, finally. I've been trying to get Sasha on the show forever. Sasha... I'll, I'll let Sasha explain what he does, but Sasha is, in terms of Lightning, he's our first living faculty member, full-time living faculty member, and we're so excited to have him. And Sasha, in one or two sentences, tell us like what you do or what you've done. What you're... Sure. Yeah. Basically, I'm, I'm a PhD candidate at Harvard in the anthropology department. I work at the intersection of archaeology and ancient DNA using ancient genomes extracted from human skeletons to understand the interactions and movements of people in prehistory with a focus geographically on North Eurasia, so Siberia and Central Asia. So sweet. So awesome. The intersection of archaeology and the human genome. I love it. We're going to start off with the quote of the week as a kind of a guiding point of our conversation. But if we stray, you folks know how it goes. It's more interesting that way. Anyways, the quote is by Pliny the Elder from natural history. And it reads, man is the only one that knows nothing, that can learn nothing without being taught. He can neither speak nor walk nor eat. And in short, he can do nothing at the prompting of nature only but weep. Sasha, do you agree? Is he right? What what he's saying basically is we can't do anything when we're born. We're useless. We're helpless. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Pliny is, is off base in, in a lot of ways. Certainly humans are pretty helpless compared to a gazelle or a sea turtle at the moment of birth. And all the attributes that we think of as human typical that distinguish humans from other primates that are, are arguably the domain of our species alone, like capacity for abstraction and art and fully formed language, however we define that, clearly are not present immediately at birth. They have to be acquired through a social process, through learning from parents, from observation, basically of other members of our species, if not more direct instruction. The statement that humans are helpless at birth is true, that humans are not immediately endowed out of the womb with the capacities that we might expect that seem typical of a adult human who has undergone kind of normal development and normal socialization. But whether this makes, whether this really is a great case for human exceptionalism, I think there's a bit more to to take issue with. Many other primates have similar long developmental process. They, They don't come out with all the social skills or look at macaques, like they don't, they have tool making capacities even as adults. And that stuff is transmitted through observation and social learning, but it's not present straight out of the womb. Likewise, with all these animals that we think of as socially complex or possessed of higher intelligence, like dolphins, whales, etc. Yeah, these are capable yeah. of locomotion. That, that's a big contrast. Humans take quite a while to, to, to learn bipedalism, to do that reliably. And, and that differs some amongst human populations, which is probably also true, this sort of long developmental process. Also true of Neanderthals and extinct human relatives that we know of from paleoanthropology. But I guess the broader, the aim of of this sort of vision of human exceptionalism is to build a case for basically that um, humans are distinct from the entire rest of, of, of the animal kingdom, from the rest of creation in this regard, which makes some of their attributes perhaps more surprising. And then on the other, maybe sets up um, an allegory for the condition of consciousness or or of, of being this kind of sapient being that has nothing except its intellect and these learned capacities to really prevent it from remaining in this sort of helpless condition. Pliny's wrong about a lot of things. He's wrong developmentally. So later on in that passage in natural history, he says that human beings are just are able to weep and are producing tears the moment of birth. That's off base. There's a lot of the specifics of the biological specifics where perhaps he wasn't the closest observer or he was um, dealing with the received wisdom that just is not true empirically. But I think the deeper point that, you know, everything that all the capacities that, that we have are not at the prompting of nature, I think that's questionable from the standpoint of, okay, sure, humans don't come out with the ability to, to speak, say, Swiss German or Sinhalese or Navajo out of the womb, but it seems like there's a pretty universal capacity for acquisition of a fully developed language. 
in the present day, people like Chomsky have argued that there's a grammatical machinery that's al already present, like not just the capacity to acquire language, but even basic syntactic operations are somehow hard-coded in, and that accounts for human ability to so rapidly acquire a language from relatively little input. And then you could say that maybe there are other instinctual aspects of, of human behavior or human capacities that are not plausibly learned or acquired socially, but maybe are ingrained at the level of hardware and not software, to use the, the common metaphor. So to put it metaphorically, we are, when we're born, we're a just loose, wet clay um, that, that its express purpose is to be molded into whatever shape it wants to be. As opposed to, like, metaphorically speaking, another animal's baby is born already formed as a statue, more or less, with small pieces that can still be adjusted. But that's it. That's all it will ever be. And maybe Pliny just mistook that blob for uselessness where he didn't see the value in the plasticity itself is that mm -hmm. or or maybe he took or maybe he took issue with the notion that yeah it, it seems like he's emphasizing the sort of malleability and maybe ignoring the fact that there or constructing an argument that overlooks aspects of structure that are already present in the clay properties predictable conditions of this material for instance, that language acquisition capacity, it seems like there, there has to be some sort of biological substrate for that to proceed so, so predictably. But yeah, so that's one take. It's, it's from the standpoint of, of biology or debates about how much of, of human nature is inscribable from, from learned culture, from external influences, from social learning versus dispositions or capacities or even the potential to maybe even the plasticity itself is, is hard, hard coded. That's a, a proposition that emerges from anthropology and sort of the, the zoology of the human species. But there's another take, another kind of criticism or another way to take issue with the statement. And that I think has been articulated both in the Greek world and interestingly in what we see from conversations with some people, some groups that are alive today. So I'm, I'm drawing, I'm, I'm referring basically to the term that in, in Greek is anamnesis, this idea that what we think of as, as learning or, or acquisition or so, something that's arrived at dialectically or through instruction has some kind of deep foundation in remembering. That's a surprising and shocking proposal, but it, it is, it's elaborated already in, in Plato, in the Socratic dialogue where he proposes that the ability to, to discern like what is a virtue, even to proceed through steps of logical argumentation, they are, are only sensible if there's a capacity to recall things that you knew or that the soul knew in the condition uh, that it had access to, that it was in prior to birth. So the proposal then is that birth, maybe this sort of relates to why the infant emerges weeping, as, as Pliny observes and puts a lot of emphasis on. Perhaps it's, it's experiencing a kind of trauma, a trauma of separation from some condition in which it had access to true knowledge, maybe deepest forms of knowledge, and that what we think of as, as education or learning or instruction is not so much a, a matter of, of taking a stamp and pressing it upon this totally malleable clay, but rather of coaxing out things that uh, maybe are, are embedded and accessible in some way already, and that are not so much like the embossing of this totally malleable material, but allowing it to be exposed to the right conditions of, of drying. And so you see the emergence of a kind of three-dimensional form that somehow it knew, but was pounded into this more sort of amorphous um, state. So this notion, basically, that what we think of as learning is really a process of recollection, of remembering, of unforgetting. Right. Which in turn implies reincarnation then, that... We are um, for the, for this to work, there there is a there has to be a mechanic of recurrence. There has the soul has to exist in in some form prior to its uh, material incarnation in a particular birth as a particular infant, uh, and this is related really to the recurrence of birth. That the souls come into existence or take material form as human beings, then they proceed through life ideally under the the best possible conditions of development reacquiring what they had access to in the state prior to birth, then undergoing senescence, aging, death, and then, as the proposal is, becoming incarnated again in some other body, in, in some other form. And this is um, unique to, to the ancient Greeks. It's when you think about reincarnation, you think about India, like Hinduism, like this is a Vedic idea. 
this is something that I think has been elaborated in greatest detail, arguably in these sorts of Dharmic traditions. So Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism in the Indian subcontinent, basically. But what may come as a surprise to some listeners is that it's not really the exclusive domain of India. And India is probably not the origination point of, of these beliefs. To give some examples closer to Europe and in, in Western Asia, this is also a strand in certain forms of Jewish esotericism. Uh, you can arguably find it in some of these more obscure religions of the Near East, the beliefs of the Alawites, and so on. So it exists in, in contexts that are, are different and probably or not very clearly historically connected to India. But what's really fascinating is that these are also present in people living even further away from the Indian subcontinent or from Greece, like in Siberia, amongst societies that historically have not been organized as states or are not subjected to governance by states where people are, are subsisting through lifestyles that are very different from those of basically the food producers, the agriculturalists or agro-pastoralists of, of India and, and the Near East and of Greece. And I think there's some really fascinating analogs, echoes. It's unclear whether perhaps it could be the case that all of these beliefs stem from some kind of very ancient Eurasian or even proto-human conception or co of, of cosmology that's viable. And in their particulars, they differ a lot. But to bring it down to the specifics of, of the example I'm itching to, to, to bring the conversation to, there are these people called Kugirs. Yeah, you, you Kugirs. For those yeah, it's uh, Y-U-K-H. I G H I R. You, I think I spelled it right. Y U K A G H I R. Yukagir. There are people of northeastern Siberia, so not really, not, not really up to the edge of the Eurasian continent. That's the domain of people like the Chukchi, but close to there, essentially in the far northeastern corner of, of the Eurasian continent, in the taiga zone. Far in from... this sort of boreal forest, yeah, not on, not in the, and not really, yeah. People of this this strip of forest that um, extends from Finland and and northern Scandinavia across the continent through Siberia all the way up to basically the shores of of Bering Strait and the Yukagir in the northeastern corner of this broad corridor. They were the, the focus of a lot of theological sort of ethnographic interest by both North American and Russian scholars. And that's something that kind of continues to the present. They are in an increasingly difficult position demographically and in their relationship to, to, to the modern states of the region, but are, are pretty distinct, are clearly distinct historically in a deep and mysterious way. Their language might not be related to any of the surrounding languages. Some people have argued that they could have a distant connection to the Uralic languages, which are much more widespread and diverse. That's unclear or not. That's, that's wide, very, there's, that's, there's not universally um, accepted. That's a lot um, farther so, wouldn't it be? Yeah, you don't have to get too far west to encounter Uralic languages. So there are relatively less known languages. So the Uralic is a language family that is named after the Ural Mountains, which are, you know, of course, quite a bit further west at the edge, the conventional edge of Asian Europe. But Uralic speakers are, are not just the Finns and the Estonians and the Hungarians, but also people called Samoyedic or Samoyeds who are present basically out into central and towards East Siberia, quite a bit closer to the Yukagiris and maybe making this proposed historical connection a bit more sensible. That, that's, Association yeah. of Samoyeds is the dog breed. So, just... so yeah, those are named after the, the people who basically developed, selectively bred those, those dogs, which have become globalized and, and outstripped awareness of the, the kind of the people who it's crafted them, basically. Way. Yeah. But anyway, so that, that's a broad situation of, of where the Yukagirs are. They, they live or traditionally have lived by terrestrial hunting. So they're not sea mammal hunters like most of the Chokchi or Inuit. They are, are, and they're not really reindeer pastoralists. So they're not tending herds of captive reindeer, but they're engaged very closely in, in terrestrial hunting on foot, basically. Of large animals like, like moose or in Eurasia, sometimes we call them elk, but large ungulates, deer, bears in an environment that is it's pretty unforgiving where there's a close proximity of, of death and, and risk to life traditionally and even with the aid of, of radios and snowmobiles and, and rifles so that's a general kind of short situation of, of the yuka gears but what was really fascinating for ethnographers starting in the late 19th century and ongoing into much more recent work is that the Yukagiris also have, and actually many other peoples of Siberia, but there's some like interesting features of the Yukagirian beliefs in particular. They believe in reincarnation, but it's, it's not this highly ethicized system that you find in India. So it's, and people are not really striving for improved rebirth 
It's not really invoked as an explanation for why there are like social differentiation between the well-off or people who are considered socially inferior as a function of birth. It's not really, the society is relatively flat in that regard, or there's not a lot of vertical structuring historically. It's yeah, like the uh, so, and so it's not, else, right. More or less. There, there were wealthier people. There are forms of inherited status. Like it's important not to simplify it into this totally egalitarian hunter-gatherer society, which is like a mythic construct. But it certainly, it's not, it doesn't have this sort of vertical structuring or a rigid assignment to a status at birth as, as you find in the caste societies of South Asia, basically. Yet nonetheless, there's a belief in reincarnation. Sometimes this is, it's related to observations and these are even more widespread. I'm sure you can find examples like even in West Africa and Central Africa, like amongst the, the Yoruba and so on. So it's, it's like actually in, in Australian, in Aboriginal Australians as well, in North America, actually believes in reincarnation or sort of the recurrence of souls or rebirth of, of people in different forms. Like it's, it's quite widespread globally and maybe has a multiplicity of, of independent origins or some kind of super deep primordial common origin. But anyway, amongst the Yukagiris, people usually talk of rebirth as happening within families. You'll see like some kind of ancestor, like a known ancestor reappearing as a child in the same kind of lineage or, or group. And it's a process that people have developed this intuition and they are able to cite specific evidence for it in like the personality traits of um, the child or in their apparent access to knowledge or residual memories that it seems if you don't believe in re reincarnation, they shouldn't have. This definite likes, dislikes, even attitudes toward the name that they are given by the parents. There are some cases where this kind of defiant oppositional personality of the child is fixed once people start referring to them by a different name that maybe is the same as, as that of the, of the ancestor that is said to be reincarnating in them. But so there, it, it, it's something that, that is, that's not clearly tied to ethical favorability or unfavorability, although there are, I think it's, a, it's, a simple, it's an oversimplification at the same time to say that this is simply just like some kind of mechanical process that reinserts people in the same lineage. Like there, it's a, there are some relations to like your conduct and your relationship with non-human beings or spirits that conditions and yeah. th there, there are some complications basically in the, in the process. Right, it's um, neat, so but this is connected to get back to the quote to this deep sort of sense that children have a sense of, of who they are and they have access to not just dispositions, likes and dislikes, but to kind of knowledge of how to exist in the world, like in the social world of that they, that they enter and adulthood, but even things that you might think of as like very specific and even dangerous skills that perhaps that in our society, you might think of as something requiring careful, direct instruction. And so it's for this reason that, you know, amongst the Yukigiris, but also amongst other societies in the subarctic, like even in North America, like many Athabascan speaking groups, like Native American groups speaking Nadene languages. There's a sense that it's okay for children to be exposed to things that we might think of as dangerous, like knives or fire or, or chainsaws, because there's this expectation or an understanding that they have not just this sort of vague self-preservational instinct, but they, they have access even in some more specific way to how to comport themselves to it. And if they accidentally injure themselves, like it's not something that is, of course, there's like great concern for the lives and the safety of the children, but there's not a, a need to insulate them from so-called adult activities of this sort, especially related to subsistence or hunting or basically the way that adults proceed to make a living in the world. Because at some level, they've had access to those skills before, and it's a matter of them figuring out, ex experience the right way to basically to, to regain and become comfortable again with these skills. Yeah, basically. It's like there's a sense that not that children are, have to be thrown in, directly into the river and they'll sink or swim. It's, of course, there's a concern for children if they do injure themselves or if they do have trouble. But it's not that's relegated to a realm of adulthood that requires detailed step-by-step -step instruction. There's like a sense that children will pick it up and they'll pick it up with a lot of, there's sort of faith in their ability to to acquire, to reacquire this, this knowledge, a, like even what we think of as very specific skills. I think we can learn a lot from two, two points. I, there's such a division, such a difference in view in modern Western societies as opposed to that. But real quick, I just wanted to share something you were talking about, reincarnation specifically within family lineages. And I just, I, I remembered something that I had completely forgotten until you were just talking about that. But my grandfather 
used to call me his grandfather when I was young until he had a stroke when I was like 15, 16. And he started saying it less often, he started saying less things often in general. But he was born in Iran, in Kermanshah, Iran, which is Western Iran in the Caucasus Mountains. And his family was Loristani and Kurdish. It's so a very isolated, like we took a DNA test of the guy and it's, there's no traceable DNA from any other ethnic group for, you know, however many generations you can trace back. There was Zoroastrian, loosely Zoroastrian, like they didn't have a fixed religion. They were not Islamic. My grandmother's family was, his was not. And he always would say this, you're my, he would just call me grandpa. And I would be like, no, you're my grandpa. I'm a little kid. He's like, you're my grandpa. And he would say it like, as a matter of fact. He's, and then my brother... I just had a younger brother, two and a half years younger. He never assigned him anything like that or any of my other cousins who were frequently around him, any of those things. It was just, he singled me out for whatever, maybe I displayed some kind of trait or something. He was just, you know, he would just say that, but he said it so very literally. He probably meant you remind me of my grandpa, but he always used it so literally. And maybe it was just a vestige of that mindset in how he grew up from his parents and whatnot. They probably had that same kind of vocabulary and like, understanding of things like yeah sometimes people just they come back or they're very similar to themselves but <clears throat> anyways yeah that's fascinating back, back to your point about that's the really children amazing. yeah back to your point about the children in these societies it's so different than how we have it now i'm curious to know your point of view on it your opinion but we have everything is divided like even down to utensils like you get little kitty forks little kitty cups you get Get your little children shows, like everything is divided for kids. Everything. The style that a children's room is supposed to look like. There's a whole aesthetic, there's a whole category of children's stuff in, in, in modern Western culture. And I I don't know if that's help I don't know if that's helping children develop. I don't know. What do you think of it? And where did it come from? I'm curious to know that. But what are your mm-hmm. thoughts? Yeah, this this sort of the construct or the idea of the child and what we think of as children's capabilities or what they could and, you know, unequivocally should not do or be exposed to. In addition to there being, as we can observe, just by comparing different cultures or different um, peoples, you know, all present in, in, in the current year, we can see vast differences in the kind of autonomy that is expected, the sort of independence or the separation in these life stages. This is also, what's interesting is that these are not, clearly not hard-coded features of cultures in the sense that you can see even within people's, if you talk about with boomers or, or Gen X Americans, there's there, people have very strong opinions about or somewhat maybe somewhat distorted recollections of their own childhood and the differences in the, the strategies and, and the expectations and the degrees of allowance that children have in the present. Clearly, like this is something that's mutable within cultures on relatively short time frames and I think that relates to perceptions of like the vulnerability of children, the size of families, the density and the shape of networks, of social networks and and expectations that have any number of causes for the rate at which children mature and take on different responsibilities and occupy occupy different roles. Certainly, I think there's a big contrast between 21st century suburban upbringing in, in the U.S. and what you could give children, what's more typical for you could give children even today. Um, but it, 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 there's, it seems like there are decision points, like all kinds of factors that impact the conception of vulnerability and of the ideal amount of autonomy and independence that children should have. And sometimes we can, we can think of all kinds of reasons. I'm sure there are all sorts of compelling socioeconomic analyses of why that's the case. But what's interesting in the case of the Yukagiris is that it seems like there's something explanatory or some kind of deep connection to this sort of very deeply ingrained understanding basically of cosmology, souls, not just human, but non-human, and the kinds of relationships and linkages to to knowledge and and a different understanding of what knowledge is as more like remembrance or filling a kind of groove that already exists and that children have access to regardless of what they're explicitly instructed in. In the case of the Yuka year, it's like it's not just related to the and, and many other Siberian peoples. Like it's not just a matter of this sort of commitment or belief in reincarnation, but it, it's also connected, I think, to a different role or a different significance of verbal instruction generally or, or verbal communication. 
there's a lot more emphasis traditionally in in Yukagir society on learning without being walked explicitly through the steps or being told you do this and then you do that and given like verbal sequences of action. There's a greater expectation and it's related to this kind of respect for the autonomy of the individual and also the confidence in their ability to acquire without explicitly being told what the steps or procedures are. There's a great quote by an anthropologist named Rana Willerslev, who is actually the identical twin brother of, of a famous ancient DNA researcher in Denmark, Eske Willerslev, that's exciting. So Rane worked for a long time with Yuka Gears and explored not just their beliefs in reincarnation, but so their understanding of what personhood is in relation to the lives and the souls of, of the animals that they hunt, like deer and elk. And so he's, he is, this is a quote from a Yuka Gear hunter that he was friends and who be, friends with and who became one of his sort of consultants for his anthropological work. This person says, this man says, um, you know, I never heard anyone say my father or grandfather did this or that. All that matters is what a person himself has experienced. And so this is really related to this kind of desire or this ideal of autonomy. To be a hunter, you, a proper hunter, you have to know how to do everything yourself. And it's a pattern of behavior that, that's oriented around maximizing opportunities to, to learn by oneself and to live autonomously, competently. And so it's what underlies this is a really great valorization of the right to one's autonomy and correspondingly an obligation to respect the autonomy of others, even if they are children. So there's, that governs even you know, the ways that um, adults speak to and expect things from and correct small children. So it, it's, there's, it, it's all woven together. These beliefs in reincarnation, this sort of understanding that experiential knowledge has priority or kind of greater pride of place compared to verbal instruction. And I think they would say certainly compared to things that are acquired purely through, through reading, like book knowledge. Yeah, this understanding of what true or the most important kind of knowledge is, it really situates at, at the highest position knowledge is, that's revealed through you, your own experience, but it's not just your own experience. It's like a matter of re-inhabiting this sort of knowledge that previous incarnations of yourself had access to. Um, yeah, definitely a, a very different conception. It's, it's not like a, a, a clay pad that you inscribe things or let things be stamped into. Uh, it's, it's an unfolding into a form that even a, a newborn child has access to or will have access to. Um, and the suggestion that there's also, it's related, it's connected to the belief that I think is similar to what we see in, in the Platonic dialogue that I mentioned earlier in our conversation, that the acquisition of, of verbal capability somehow marks a kind of a rupture. So that's what prevents these children from having unfettered or unobscured access and why they have to regrow into and reacquire some aspects of, of what their previous selves of this continuous reincarnating self had close at hand in its previous adulthood. It's that there is some a kind of forgetting or distancing, a sort of rupture that seems to be related not just to the, the trauma of birth itself, but to the acquisition of, of verbal knowledge, of development of, of the self that, you know, the, of, of, a ver, of a verbal self. And so in these accounts of reincarnation, like these children seem to have um, a clear sense or there's a greater freshness and vividness of this the, the previous incarnation earlier in their childhood. And then gradually as they develop in, into, into more verbal beings, there's a lessening or a receding of their access to these previous lives. It's so very fascinating. I wonder when it seems that this shift from valuing experienced knowledge, like the knowledge experience versus taught knowledge coincided with greater society, like cities and, and empire and state. Is that true? I'm just, is that true? Yeah, I think in, in a cross-cultural sense, the, re the receding of, of this, where, where we see this sort of outlook and preserved and visible and still alive today, it's in societies that are, are not organized traditionally under the rule of centralized states that have, have strong ability to prescribe what you can and can't do where codes of law are formalized into written documents. It's something that survives where people have this direct and, and very vivid engagement with non-human beings as the source of their subsistence, like especially amongst these subarctic hunting groups. And it, comparatively, if it was present at all, it seems like it would have to have been de-emphasized. Authority would have had to have been positioned 
and invested in different kinds of people and in different modes of knowledge transmission. Uh, and in fact, society-wide, there would have to have been a shift to a different conception of what the most valuable forms of knowledge are. Al although, to be fair, what we see in the Platonic dialogues, the, as in the, the example of Mino from earlier, clearly this is not a subarctic hunter-gatherer society. I think it's, it's probably a mistake to, to tie it too closely to a particular kind of subsistence, like because it, it, it seems that at least at an intellectual level, and at the level of kind of metaphysical commitment, like we can, this belief can exist and and persist in very different kinds of societies and cultures. But yeah, yeah I think at a global scale, it was an exception, yeah. um, right? In his own society, that, that's like, certainly fair. Um, I look at history and I see the evidence. I don't know if you can call it evidence, but I see the, the where that exists. One. The other view doesn't, or where that view exists, that type of society doesn't. It does seem like there are some incompatibilities. And I, I think probably the the biggest obstacle to the survival or the, the flourishing of this, this conception of knowledge that's historically traditionally prevalent amongst the Yukigiris and the related culturally similar groups, uh, subarctic groups I, I talked about, is that with this sort of outlook, a person, I think I'm paraphrasing Willerslev again, Rana Willerslev again here. A person in this sort of in this sort of conception of knowledge and of of human beings of personhood knows from the start everything he or she will ever come to know, and so in that regard is not in debt to anyone for this knowledge. And I think the the construction of, of systems basically of of intellectual debt that maybe have some interesting relationship to the economic understandings of debt and, and obligation. That's something I haven't really explored myself too deeply, but it just occurs to me as probably having some interesting connection. It means that there are no creditors or people who are, are regarded by default as banks with kind of a, a privileged access to repositories of knowledge or like the capacity to mint new knowledge. And so it's a different, I think it, it certainly is connected to and excludes like a different conception of authority and of, of, of dependence. It's funny because let, let's say we live in that kind of society of, of intellectual creditors now, but it's hypocritical because it's like those experts, so to say, of each field of necessary knowledge, not even experts, just like the parents who teach the next generation. Anyone who has knowledge teaching the next generation, they learned it from someone else. So it's maybe it's better to adopt this understanding of maybe you don't have to adopt the reincarnation idea of it, the, the attitude of, look, you're learning this from me, but I learned it from someone else. And it's so far down the chain that I'm, I'm just paying it forward. Instead of saying you're in debt to me, I, I am paying forward the process to you. It's, it's a different way of looking. Yeah, it's a, I think probably that's a healthier conception of, of academic and intellectual authority that you probably can and should sustain regardless of your beliefs on reincarnation or the greater importance of experiential versus verbal knowledge. Yeah, I think so. Now, I could continue on about, I have two ways I could pivot. I could, yeah, let's do that. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go back to Pliny. Let's just go back to the quote real quick. Mm -hmm. Pliny the Elder, or Plinius, whatever his name was, was a Roman uh, citizen. I don't know, did he serve in the military? Gaius Plinius Secundus, he was, I think he, he did, he served in the, he had military command in the Roman Empire, but went on a lot of like expeditions, like his own little expeditions, or proto expeditions. Um, often like in the field, he would just like, like yeah. on campaign, he, he would take a detour to go check out some plants or animals. <laughs> While mm -hmm. there were like hostile forces nearby, I think that's right. just hilarious. Um, His priorities in order. Yeah. <laughs> this is the craziest <laughs> thing. Could you imagine like a General Eisenhower World War II just going over and getting some samples from some beaver dam in France? I think, I wonder, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's probably there are some similar episodes in like Ernst Junger's journal with his yeah. interest in natural history and entomology in particular. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's always fascinating. Beetle when, detours. So. Yeah, it's fascinating when these... We constructed them as fields when they intersect in, in, in people's lives. And I think that's more authentic to how we all live our lives. You're not just Sasha, the archaeologist. You are you're Sasha, the man. And you engage in archaeology, you engage in business, you engage in relationships with family, with strangers, across countries. But anyways, Pliny, 
this is a rather disdainful view of children, of people. Therefore, he's glorifying everything else, like all the other animals. Is his view preceded and followed by other peoples, any other individuals or cultures that value animals or admire animals in some capacity above you? I know now plenty of people do, but like, what is the lineage of that line of thought? I think it's difficult to give a real a comprehensive account of the genealogy of this idea. I, I think you, animals, on the one hand, both are instrumentalized or turned into objects or resources in societies where subsistence, I, I think, is doesn't require these sustained intimate connections and familiarity with the behavior of, of wild animals. I, th I think this conception, like in the Yukagir worldview, personhood is a status that includes not just human beings, but also bears and, and elk and, and deer. Um, and there's an, an understanding that what we think of as like this the circle of humanity, I, I guess using our own terminology, it's these sorts of relations that that Yukagiris would have with, with other people in the community are echoed in a, structurally in sort of the way that the, the way they understand animals to relate to other members of the same species. There, it's, I, I think in many other societies, you, not, you, you don't just have animals instrumentalized into or turned into kind of quasi-mechanical things or sources of, of resources, sources of labor. Um, you also have them turned into allegories, stripped of these sorts of personhood-like qualities so that they're just rendered into like a living and breathing manifestations of, of, of a particular Sim like symbolic notion, like a character form. trait, yeah, yeah, like avarice or greed or nobility, and even the ones that seem complementary or, or favorable, I think they certainly are not compatible with the conception of the animals as anything as as beings that are comparable in any real sense to to humans into the variety of, of what they can embody and, and express, and in their access to to personhood, like it's they're turned into emblems basically. And I think that that goes hand in hand with a receding of the importance of having relations, connections with animals on, a, on an ongoing, with, with the degree of intimacy that you find in these like boreal hunting societies. Yeah. But is, I was talking with this Nico on the previous podcast <laughs> at the time we're talking, it hasn't released, but it'll, it'll be the one prior to this one. He was talking about totemic societies that, but even didn't totemic societies choose like their animal or, or group of animals and that was it was a representation of their society like they embodied all the traits of that animal and that animal did have traits that other animals didn't like the bear was had traits that the wolf did not have or, or deer or mm -hmm. eagle is that but so what i'm saying is surely they didn't just see every animal as same as a person oh you could be anything surely they had some coloring of these are generally what bears are like bears generally mm -hmm. are strong confrontational uh, mm -hmm. you know wolves are yeah yeah i see what you're getting at it's okay it's uh, difficult I, I to generalize know. like across yeah across like hunter gatherers right. or non-state yeah. societies the conceptions of what an animal is and the boundaries of humanness or personhood are like very different across these societies. But oftentimes in societies that understand themselves as having a, a special connection as collectively to a particular kind of animal, these are mediated through understandings of kinship and descent and usually relate to like a cosmo cosmological understandings of a state in which the humanness or the personhood of animals was more accessible, less ob obscured by some kind of subsequent rupture. But even in the present, while acknowledging that there are like species typical characteristics that maybe can be regarded positively or negatively, certainly are observed and are, are the focus of kind of a cultural consensus. Even granting that, it is interesting how different like the conceptions of animalness or of belonging to a different species can be in, in some of these societies. The, like amongst the Yuka gears, you have various categories of non-human beings and spirits, but there's a funny equivalency of perspective in the sense that maybe for humans, there are these predatory spirits that basically are like ravenous and demonic and they hunt human beings and try to consume their souls. And the funny thing is that there, there is some sense that to, to deer, the relations with other deer are ones of, of personhood. 
that if you were to occupy the vantage points of a deer, you would like maybe even at a sensory level, see other deer as humans and the human bipedal primate hunter, like as mm. not, not just analogous to, but the more at a, at a more direct level of equivalency, they would, we would be the demons to them. So it's, yeah, it, it, it's this funny kind of, they're, they're similar families of, of outlooks that are, are actually surprisingly similar in a lot of regards to what we see in Siberia in a lot of traditional societies of the Amazon. So various thinkers have called this sort of Amazonian perspectivism, but it's something that seems accessible and subscribed to by a lot of peoples that have had in, in which hunting kind of modeling, not just the behavior, but the outlook, the thinking, the personhood of beings that we would consider non-human species is salient and of critical importance to survival and is occupies a central place in sort of cultural conceptions of how the universe is arrayed and organized. Yeah. I, okay, two things before we wrap up, we're gonna, we're coming to the end here. Just one off question. Are there any societies, I guess there are only, are great apes found anywhere that, other than Africa? The orangutans are also great apes. Yeah, oh, so Southeast Asia as well. Borneo. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, that's so interesting. There's this man I know, he's a 80 something year old gentleman at a coffee shop I do my work at. And when he was younger, he, I think in the sixties, he went, he went through all of Asia. He started in Japan and then just went down and then east. And he went through Indonesia and he told me that the locals where there were orangutans, he told me something very interesting that the word that was used for a person was orang. Like a man, a person was an orang. Mm-hmm. It could have been Utan was the man, but I think it was Orang referred to. No, a no, you're right. It's Orang. Yeah. Orang. And then so the, the yeah. Orang Utan just meant like something, the person that's this little way, you know, like, I don't know, maybe. Yeah. Like, uh, orang maybe. Utan means man, man of the forest. Oh, forest, yeah. fascinating. I'm so yeah. glad you answered yeah. that question for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. So I'm just wondering, I'm wondering if there are any totemic societies or like early societies where they, that interacted with great apes and like how they how that went down because they're so similar to us. Do you have any anecdotal? Yeah, so just uh, even in the home range of the orangutan, there is this sense that they are not so distant or in this sort of not so distant from human beings or maybe just a kind of human being, that the affinity and the proximity, in, in it's, it's really palpable and controversial in a lot of these societies. Yes. Not many of whom don't propose that the humans and orangs necessarily share common ancestry or anything like, like that necessarily. But there is this understanding that you have this generic concept, human, and the orangutan, like these men of the forest, are not excluded from it. You have the orangutan and then the orang laut, maybe our people, the bajau, like these groups that live on the sea. So you have men of the sea, men of the forest, and it's not necessarily a qualitative. The, the orangutans are not necessarily qualitatively on some kind of lower tier of being right that, yeah that, that reminds me of of like early, like creation story myths of of one that comes to mind is the creation of man in greek mythology like how, how zeus commissions prometheus to like mold mankind and there were a whole bunch of different there were there were like green men and blue men and red men and then they were all, most of them were accidentally wiped out from some accident or something. I, I forget. There are other myths that I, I, I can't recall, but there are other humans, like other humans that don't, aren't around today. And I just think that's so interesting that it was in our subconscious, maybe because of interaction with primates or with now extinct human or human adjacent species like Neanderthals and, and whatnot. That are no longer around. Maybe that's yeah. It's it's, it's certainly conceivable that there that there might be kind of deep Paleolithic roots to all these categories of hum, quasi human like beings, or the sense that there were that there were complicated creations, and that these near relatives or beings that blurb the conventional boundaries between human and non human. I think it's it, certainly we know that there was this kind of extended interaction in many parts of the world, not just with pretty relatively proximate species, but also more extensive interaction with great apes than you might imagine from their constricted present-day distribution. I think both of these things have 
contributed in, in part to, to some of these categories of beings or some of these residual, like lingering intuitions or maybe echoes of memories. Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. It's so amazing. It's so fascinating. And we only know just a, little, just a little bit. And people like you spend days and weeks and months like chiseling away at things and dusting things away and, and traveling, going to jungles and volcanoes. Sasha was at a volcano two weeks ago. That's why he couldn't join the podcast sooner. But doing all this work to just get little bits and pieces of the story bit by bit. And it's this was a discussion with Nico on another podcast. Uh, at the end of the day, there's still a lot of filling in. There's creative work done. You just fill in the narrative based on new evidence that you know. And every new piece of empirical data that you have changes your narrative. But at the end of the day, you're still extrapolating from that tiny little sliver you have of what it was like. you. Because we can never go back and see. Even like ancient Rome, we have writings by... We know the guy's name, Pliny, or Gaius Plinius Secundus. We really didn't, we really will never know what it was like to be a Roman living in, in, in the Roman Empire anywhere, even though it's the most well-documented, one of the most well-documented ancient historical societies. Just <laughs> fascinating to you. And that, so me splooging about that wants to, I'm going to dovetail into the final question of the day here. You, Sasha, what drove you to do this? What, what, like, what excites you about what you're doing right now? And just share a little bit of that excitement with us. Um, I'm just mm -hmm. curious to know, why does Sasha do this? Yeah, I think what I, I'm, among the things that kind of motivate me and impel me the most powerfully, and I think what drew me into archaeology is a sense that there are boundaries of, at least conventionally, of, of human knowledge, of human understanding, but there are some domains of life, of activity in, in this world that bring you continually up to and allow you to punch through or to push through or to peek through this kind of this edge, this shell. And you continually have the sense doing that when you engage in, in archaeology, when you try to imagine or to position yourselves in the perspectives of people who are long dead, whose names have not come down to us. And with archaeology, you're in a privileged position in the sense of having, of being able to cheat, of, of being able to access the past, not by projecting inferences back from the very fragmentary and confusing superimpositions of, of remnants that have come down to us all the way to the present, but to directly access these windows into something not quite as good as time travel, but this often foggy and cracked window, but a window nonetheless into something closer to direct observation, into periods of time that are not accessible, not accessible through texts, to lifeways, to people, to individual stories of, of individual beings that you could never imagine on, on the basis of written records. And to get back to this tension between verbal and experiential learning, you get to see channels, routes of accessing this enormous collective heritage of humanity and the more particular stories of specific regions of the world through senses and methods of inquiry that are, are nonverbal and are not bound to the accepted authority of, of texts and their, and their transmitters. So being able to push up through the edge and being able to access kinds of knowledge that are closer to, to seeing than, than to reading, I think are, are in large part what, what drove me to this field. Um, and the connection to Siberia, I think it's, it's a bit more mysterious of a course, but I often myself have the sense of being in places that I somehow was in before and being able to experience that in a really visceral way is something that solidified my certainty that this is the part of the world where I want to work in. Sasha, the explorer. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sasha. Ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed today's episode, leave a, leave a comment, check out the links in the bio join our WhatsApp group. You'll have access to tons of groups on all the topics we discussed here. And we have what we call our reading groups starting at Lightning. And Sasha's is called the Mammoth Shadow by Lightning. That's right. Mammoth Shadow. That's right. And it's I'm more or less talking about what we've been discussing on this podcast today, right? This, this... Yeah, it's a broad, broadly, the, the unifying theme is a connection to North Eurasian shamanism, beliefs about souls, not just in the context of reincarnation, but travel between worlds, direct experience of the underworld, of upper worlds, 
and the techniques that people have traditionally used in this region to access and to experience that. Fascinating. Yes. Yeah. Right away, I want to join and, and listen in. It's uh, I think it's bi-weekly. That's right. We'll include a include a link in this bio to the to the meetup to the to the link you can access this at. And there's more than just that. We have things on Pirkei Avot, a Jewish uh, reading group led by Zohar, and others. And more will open up. And it's just part, one small part of the offering that Lightning will be giving will be bringing to you guys. So, anyways, thanks for listening, Sasha. Thank you so much for joining. It was incredible. I learned a lot, and I hope you enjoyed our time. Thanks so much, Cyrus. It was a real pleasure. Until next time.